I'm Stephen Cassavy. I'm a thoracic surgeon at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today I'm going to talk to you about the thymus gland and the reasons that it may be relevant to patients uh, such as yourself or your family member. The thymus gland uh, can be affected by a number of things such as tumors called thymomas or thymic carcinomas and it also can be involved in a condition called myasthenia gravis. We'll cover those in this brief uh, video. The thymus gland is a gland that sits right back behind the breastbone. It's an H-shaped gland. In other words, it has two upper poles that come together and then they have two lower poles. The thymus's role is one that is sometimes poorly understood because it relinquishes its role later on to other parts of the body. Prior to birth, it has an important role in the immune, in the development of the immune system, and it carries that role on for the first few years of life, and then does relinquish those duties onto other organs in the body, such as the spleen and the bone marrow. After that, it's a gland that sits behind the breastbone and, for lack of a better description, generally can just get into trouble. And it's for that reason that in recent times we've identified it as a potential area for treating certain diseases, such as myasthenia gravis. One of the problems that can happen to the thymus is that it can develop tumors. It can be a site where tumors from other parts of the body can spread to, called metastasis, or it can form its own tumors, called thymomas. One of the interesting things is that typically thymomas have, been not, have not been the most aggressive types of tumors. And in the past, there's been a misunderstanding that, in terms of the naming of these tumors. In many cases, people associated thymomas with so-called benign tumors, and they are not. Thymomas are malignant tumors. They're cancers and need to be treated. They may be, behave less aggressively, but they are tumors, and it's an important distinction. The old nomenclature or the old naming of a benign thymoma has no meaning currently in our understanding of thymic tumors. When a thymoma is diagnosed, it's important to do what we do when we diagnose all malignancies, and that's to stage it. Staging is the process of looking how far afield a tumor may be. Often, thymomas are localized to the tumor itself within the thymus gland, and therefore are eminently treatable. Currently, the options for treating thymoma mostly include surgical resection. If the thymoma is appropriately located and is small enough, and of early stage, if a thymoma is of a more advanced size or stage, it may require a conventional sternotomy or opening of the midline of the chest to remove the tumor completely. A different type of thymic malignancy is a thymic carcinoma. These tend to be a more aggressive type of thymic tumor, also treated surgically if they are early stage. A later stage thymic carcinoma may require other treatments such as chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Again, staging or finding how far afield the tumor may be, both locally, in other words, what it's invading, potentially invading into, or distantly into other organs, is an important consideration in terms of determining what treatment option is best for you. The thymus gland can also be associated and involved in a disease called myasthenia gravis. This is an autoimmune disease that affects the nerve ending or receptors and hampers or uh, causes problems in the relay of information to make muscles work. 
this is a great example of a disease that requires coordination and collaboration between medical specialties. In this situation, close work between a neurologist who is trained and familiar with treating myasthenia gravis, working alongside a thoracic surgeon can be very valuable to the patient. Again, there is a standard workup to first determine exactly the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. Then the next step is to stabilize the patient's symptoms medically with medications such as mestinon or steroids. Occasionally, intravenous immunoglobulin or plasmapheresis is necessary to help stabilize the disease. Once the disease is stabilized in terms of symptoms, at that point it's worth discussing the option of thymectomy with a thoracic surgeon. Again, if the disease is not stabilized, surgery is not appropriate as the disease can get worse for the short term following surgery. So it's important to stabilize the symptoms with medications prior to embarking on a surgical resection. Now recently, a, an international, multinational, multi-institutional study, a randomized controlled study, looked at the effect of surgery versus best medical care in patients with myasthenia gravis. And it found a benefit to surgical resection or surgical removal of the thymus gland. This is an important finding because it shows that there's a value in removing the thymus gland for patients with myasthenia gravis. The reason why there was doubt previously is that when you remove the thymus gland for patients with myasthenia gravis, there's not an immediate response. It's not like turning the lights on or off. There's a period after the thymus is removed where the symptoms will remain. And for that reason, the patients need to stay on their myasthenia medications. And it's over time, under the supervision of an expert neurologist, that as the symptoms allow, the neurologist will, along with the patient, wean the patient of those myasthenia medications. It's also important to note that many patients are improved with surgery, but not all. And it's because of those two issues that it's not an immediate response and it's not 100% of patients who show that response that there was a question about the value of thymectomy for myasthenia gravis. Now, following that important and well-constructed uh, randomized controlled trial, we do know that there is a value for patients with myasthenia gravis to have their thymus removed. So it's important that once the symptoms have been stabilized, that a discussion occur between the patient, their neurologist, and a thoracic surgeon who is familiar and expert at removing the thymus gland and the different options for removing the thymus gland be undertaken once the myasthenia symptoms have been controlled. In terms of options for removing the thymus gland surgically, there is the conventional route of removing the thymus gland through a midline sternotomy or cutting of the mid midline breastbone. But recently, in the last 10 to 15 years, we have come to a point in surgical technique and technology to allow for a very proper and complete removal of the thymus gland through minimally invasive options, either through what is termed a transcervical thymectomy, an incision just above the breastbone in the lower neck, or a thoracoscopic, uh, or sometimes called video-assisted VATS technique through small incisions on either side. The minimally invasive routes allow for patients to recover quicker from the surgical procedure and 
the vast majority of patients are able to leave the hospital the day after their surgery. It allows them also to return to their usual activities much quicker. It's important to discuss the options with your surgeon to be certain that that option is right for you and that your surgeon is comfortable performing the surgery in that format. There is a certain overlap in the issues of thymoma and myasthenia gravis. Patients with thymoma may also present with symptoms of myasthenia gravis. Also, patients with myasthenia gravis may have a thymoma, but both are not necessarily joined. You can have patients with thymoma without symptoms of myasthenia and patients with myasthenia who do not have a thymoma. Patients will be referred to a thoracic surgeon for a number of reasons. Often, I will see a patient who's had a new mass identified in the front of their chest underneath the breastbone, an area called the anterior mediastinum. That's where the thymus gland exists. So a mass in the thymus or in the area of the thymus is a good reason to see a thoracic surgeon to discuss the diagnosis as well as possible treatment. Another route that uh, patients end up coming to see me for is when they've been diagnosed and identified as having myasthenia gravis by a neurologist and the discussion is now relevant on whether a thymectomy will help this patient and whether they're a candidate for a thymectomy and which approach to take, either the conventional sternotomy versus the minimally invasive thoracoscopic or transcervical route.